Warning, the following presentation contains cold, hard truths that might change the way you think. Viewer discretion won't do you any good now. Are extraterrestrials actually visiting us? Have they been here all along? Stories of abductions and the countless sightings of unexplainable flying phenomena. Is it for real? Or is it just a bunch of old, white cult leaders? And why is this famous depiction of the gray alien so commonplace in our popular culture? Did we just conjure this image ourselves? Or is it based on something that we've actually seen in real life? Whatever the truth may be, this is a topic that a lot of people take very seriously. Paul Hellier is a former Canadian Minister of Defense, and he believes that aliens have arrived. The late Edgar Mitchell, who passed away recently, the sixth man on the moon, believed that aliens have arrived. Several years ago, the FBI declassified a handful of documents that prove they take UFOs seriously. Even John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign manager, who was also chief of staff to Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, is an outspoken advocate for unsealing the truth about UFOs. And the question of, of government investigations of, of UFOs, it's time to find out what, what the truth really is that's out there. Uh, we ought to do it really because it's right. Last year, Podesta tweeted, my biggest failure of 2014 was not securing disclosure of the UFO files. He even claimed to have convinced Hillary Clinton to declassify the files. This could be yet another hollow political promise, but he claims to be serious about this, and it's understandable. There are hundreds of supposed tales of alien visitation, and the theory that this whole phenomenon was entirely inspired by War of the Worlds and old science fiction films is not a valid conclusion conclusion, because UFO sightings go way further back than that. 19th century, 17th century. There were even UFO sightings during the classical age. I'm just gonna show you what I think is the most credible evidence for alien visitation, and then you can tell me what you think. December 9th, 1965, thousands of people in at least six different U.S. states report seeing a large, brilliant fireball streaking through the skies. While some assumed it to be a meteor, residents in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, claimed to see something crash in a nearby wooded area. Some locals, including fire department members, claimed the object resembled an acorn or a bell, and writing that resembled Egyptian hieroglyphs was also seen said to have been seen on the base of the object. And according to printed news and radio reports from that time, the local townspeople were blocked off by an intense military presence who came in and removed the object on a flatbed truck. Of course, the military claimed they found nothing in the woods. But there was a statue made of said craft that is now on display near the Kecksburg fire station. From July 12th to July 27th, 1952, a series of UFO reports over Washington, D.C. made national headlines. This event was known as the Invasion of Washington. The thing I want to make most clear about this event, though, is that this video, although awesome and vibrant with color, is absolutely fake. Unfortunately, there exists no photo or video evidence of this alleged event. All we really know is what was printed in the newspapers and what was said by the locals. But this was a highly publicized event that did make front page headlines around the country. On September 27, 1989, a flying saucer allegedly landed in Usney Park in Voronezh. Then out walked a three-eyed alien and what appeared to be its robot companion. This was supposedly seen by a few dozen people. They had the chance to talk to many eyewitnesses, adults as well as kids, policemen, school teachers, scientists. The underlying theme was that giant-like beings exited from strange-looking craft, did some research, and fly away. The Soviet Scientific Commission even ordered an official inquiry into the alleged incident. And the news program A Current Affair also ended up traveling to the location to do a segment on the event. Again, I have no idea if these people are making this whole thing up or not. But the thing about this one and everything else in this video is that none of this stuff has been debunked or proven not to be true. On July 7th, 1947, a flying saucer supposedly crashes at a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell Daily Record prints an article the next day on July 8th claiming that a flying saucer of unknown origin was captured at the ranch. 
Despite many locals claiming that they did in fact see a mysterious craft of unknown origin, the army quickly retracted their statement and issued a new one on July 9th, saying that it was actually a downed weather balloon. These photos were released of Major Jesse Marcel alongside General Roger Ramey inspecting what they claimed was the remains of the Roswell weather balloon. But many years later, Jesse Marcel came out and admitted that what they actually found in the Roswell crash was something else. It was not anything from this earth that I'm quite sure of, because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all the materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. The Wikipedia page for the Roswell crash claims that the incident was the result of Project Mogul, a top secret endeavor involving microphones being flown on high altitude balloons. But if you look up Project Mogul and you see what those balloons actually looked like, it doesn't quite match the witness descriptions of uh, an alien ship. Also, look at how many people have come out about Roswell over the years. You just shut up, nothing happened, uh, etc. And when you're in the service, you do what they say. And I was writing it down, uh, and after we got all through with it, I kind of awed, and he said, I want you to give it to the local newspapers and radio stations and do it post haste. And all he got in reply was a yes, sir, and away I went. He said, the incident happened there was a spacecraft. He said there were graves out there. He told me about the, the graves. He said he got out there and then turned around and all of a sudden there was three of them laying there. So they bundled them up and took them back to the dispensary on the base. She lived a very frightened life because they, they had told her not to ever speak of it again and, and what the consequences would be and she was frightened her whole life long. And inside they were working in a small creature. Did it look human? No. No. You feel confident that that was not a human being? No, I don't think it was a human being. I got a real feeling from him that he was telling the truth. This mortician claims to have been a part of the real Roswell alien autopsy, not that fake video by Ray Santilli, and that his nurse actually caught a glimpse of the deceased extraterrestrial beings. Two pathologists said there wasn't anything in, their, in the anatomy books, there wasn't anything in what our medical schools, they had never seen anything like this. They only had two orifices, they didn't have earlobes, they had two ear canals. The mouth was only about one inch. And that's the way she described it to me. Her supervisor called and said, your friend has been transferred out. And I had a serial number and everything else, but I never have found her this day. I've never made contact with her. So, And he just said, look, mister, you don't go in and start any rumors and Roswell's. Nothing happened out here. And then that's when he really told me, he said, somebody be picking your bones out of the sand if you do that. So. Around 3 a.m. on Christmas morning of 1980, at the former Royal Air Force Station RAF Woodbridge in Suffolk, England, a security patrol sees strange lights descending into Rendlesham Forest. While searching the wooded area, one of the servicemen, Sergeant James Penniston, and an airman named John Burroughs claimed to have found a craft of unknown origin. If you search Rendlesham Forest into Google, this incident is the first thing that comes up. I couldn't tell the front or back to it. I mean, there was no... Uh, engines on one side or no cockpit. Now, unlike Roswell, this event involved not a crash ship, but one that landed itself steadily in the middle of the woods. The fabric of the craft was smooth, was like glass. There was like lights on it. it was somehow it was in the fabric of the craft. Peniston notices several strange symbols. They were like markings. Uh, there were several, maybe six symbols. I'm a rational person. I wanted a rational explanation of what was going on. I could not come up with one. Then the object, whatever it was, lifted up and then moved back away over the trees. I've never seen any craft move that fast in my uh, entire Air Force career, and uh, I don't think I ever will again. But two days later, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt reports seeing star-like hovering lights that would periodically beam down streams of light. They were elliptical with multicolored lights. They turned from elliptical to full circles while we watched. There were two objects to the south, one of which came overhead at high speed. 
sent down a laser-like beam at our feet, and as suddenly as it appeared, it disappeared. Several other people have come out and claimed witness to this event. Peniston and Burroughs even testified in front of Mike Gravel, Carolyn Kilpatrick, and other esteemed former members of Congress, telling them this exact story. He touched the craft, right? As I, you know, uh, ran my hand from the uh, fabric of the craft, uh, it was smooth to touch. You ran your hands along it? Oh, uh, yeah. I, as I came around, I, I seen there was an inscription on, on the front, and uh, when I seen the the glyphs, I... This is what you saw, right? That's what I saw. <laughs> now, this event that you see here was called the Citizens' Hearing on Disclosure. This event, which was organized by these two studs, had dozens of high-ranking military officials testifying that they were all involved in the extraterrestrial cover-up. The Rendlesham Forest slash Bent Waters Landing was one of the dozens of incidents described throughout this hearing. There was even an entire day dedicated to Roswell where Jesse Marcel Jr. testified along with Colonel Richard French, who claimed that he was tasked with shooting down rogue flying saucers. Now, I actually happened to be involved in the editing and post-production of the 30-hour DVD box set of this hearing. And after having sat through the entirety of this thing multiple times, all I can really say is that there are a ton of high-ranking figures who believe wholeheartedly that this phenomenon is not a hoax. I say without equivocation, we are not alone in the cosmos. We have neighbors. We should try to get to understand them and to cooperate with them. Thank you. There have been ET visitation. There have been crashed craft. There have been uh, uh, material and bodies recovered. The main thing I learned from the citizens' hearing is that the bulk of these tales involve UFOs temporarily disarming nuclear stockpiles. There was a whole day of the hearing dedicated to just those type of stories. First call was to report unidentified uh, lighted objects flying above the facility. Very odd maneuvers, uh, nothing a, an aircraft could do. Minutes later, the FSC phoned again and reported in a very agitated state that there was a large oval-shaped object hovering above the front gate. It was um, a red, pulsating, lighted object. As I started to inform my commander, our missiles began to shut down. We lost alert status on all 10 missiles while this object was above our facility. Now, even all the people at the citizen hearing are just a fraction of the huge amount of military or naval intelligence personnel who have gone on record to say that they were involved in the cover-up of extraterrestrial visitation. Just look up UFO testimony and see how many different people there actually are. After years of researching this stuff, I haven't even seen half of them. But let's get back to our list of big events. On February 24th, 1942, a mysterious aircraft flew from Long Beach to Santa Monica that scared the crap out of the Coast Artillery Brigade. The Army sounded off air raid sirens, ordered a total blackout of the LA area that lasted four hours. As a mysterious bright orange craft hovered over Los Angeles, the brigade began firing round after round of 50 caliber machine guns and 12 pound shells towards the mysterious craft. No wreckage whatsoever was recovered, which I don't know. I think that's pretty extraordinary. Whatever the hell that thing was. Just a few hours later, in a press conference held by Secretary of the Navy at the time, Frank Knox, he claimed the event to be a false alarm due to anxiety and war nerves, once again using the weather balloon defense. But really? Would the army really spend that much artillery on a weather balloon? That's some serious war nerves. They shot so much ammo at that craft that there were actually civilian casualties from all the falling artillery. Several people died as a result of the blackout and by shell fragments falling from the barrage. Would a false alarm really get that carried away? And no other country claimed responsibility for it. U.S. Army planes quickly took to the dark skies, but whether they contacted the object has not been announced. Searchlights closely followed the object down the coast and kept it centered in their glare. Shells frequently could be seen bursting near the object, but none appeared to hit it. Then the ship disappeared for the second time over the ocean. We return you now to CBS in New York. Aliens come and visit us, and we fire lethal weapons at them the entire time. Now back to... We were sent there to uh, provide perimeter security to this radar installation. Basically, this thing went up the hill and then off. It was buried in, in, in the side of a cliff. And when I first saw it, you know, I was scared. It scared the, you know, the heck out of me, you know. I didn't know what to do. And so I could see the back of it, and there were these large vents. Well, that, they look like vents, sort of like a fish gill, 10 meters in width and about 20 meters in length. But uh, I felt this presence 
I think the Cree, and I, t I told Leslie this, I thought the creatures were, tr they conned me, and, and it was like weird, and they were, I think they were trying to communicate with me, like, I guess telepathically. It's really weird, and I don't believe in it and any of that stuff. And they're yelling at me and they're, they're hollering and cursing and you didn't see anything, you know, and we'll do you and your whole goddamn family. And they're, they're you know, it was, it was basically that for about eight or nine hours. They were like, look, man, we're gonna, we're gonna take you off in a helicopter and just kick your ass out. I was sitting in a chair and I was handcuffed to the chair and I couldn't move. Just me, Sergeant Allen and Sergeant Ankins were the only ones that saw it. Now this guy is interesting because he is by far the youngest person to ever come forward about this stuff. And he seems genuine as he tells his absolutely mind-blowing story. And I, I saw them what they look like. Oval egg head with big dark eyes, uh, a nose and a small mouth, new ears. What it looked like is that it had been hit with maybe a serviced air missile. And they could have radioed the Peruvian and said, take them out, and then they shot it down. That they were not here to harm us. That's really what, what it felt like. And my first duty station, uh, uh, 2nd Marine Air Wing, uh, 28th uh, Marine Air Control Group, 2nd Low Altitude Air Defense Battalion, Cherry Point, North Carolina. If you had a whole craft, you took very serious precautions because while I still state they are not hostile, but you could cause some serious accidents which would result in death. I'm not going to get into it how it was with the family when I had to leave because you get a little emotional because you think about what could happen. When you go out, you make a recovery, and when you make that recovery, you handle it the same way you would as if you were out there getting up on an uh, airplane accident or you have a hazardous material type situation. I am prepared to state that I have been at locations where craft of unknown origin that did not originate on the face of this planet was there. I am prepared to state that while I was there, we saw bodies of entities that were not born on this planet. I am prepared to state that we had what, we, what they referred to as interfacing with those entities. We're talking about a highly intelligent civilization. Now, honestly, I have no idea if this guy's telling the truth or just making all this up. I couldn't tell you for sure. But over the years, he's gotten more and more convincing. Now, if you go to his Facebook page, you'll find that he's uploaded tons of supposed declassified documents pertaining to his past work. No idea if it's real, but it sure is a lot of effort either way. Uh, as soon as I got to the place where I could look down, I could see where there was a little kidney-shaped door that opened on the side, and I saw one of the creatures lying out there. I went ahead and told him I needed an officer. I needed an officer to come up there. That this wasn't right. Ever since he left the army, Stone says he's been trying to get the American government to admit to what he says he saw. In short, we have recovered alien debris, not of this earth. March 13th, 1997. The Phoenix Lights are probably the biggest UFO sighting known to man. Thousands of Phoenix residents saw this thing. Now, something that people don't make clear often enough is that the Phoenix Lights were actually two distinct events. First, a massive black boomerang-shaped UFO slowly glided over Phoenix to the edge of Tucson, producing no sound and bearing five fire-like lights underneath it. Then, a series of stationary lights were seen above the Phoenix area, which the Air Force claimed wore flares. I don't even really care about the stationary lights event, but the boomerang thing is where it's at. And I went in and jokingly said to my wife, we got a UFO coming over. We saw this incredible sized vehicle. There were five huge lights in the very front of it, and it was in a boomerang shape. Just a big, big, big platform just flying with lights in front of it. I could see it was covering stars, so I knew it was something, something solid. And it was definitely not an aircraft, an aircraft as we know it. We didn't go fetch a camera. We didn't do anything but sit there and watch it. You actually tell yourself not to blink because you might miss something. It looked like a flying carpenter square. We all came back in and we were talking about it and then we all kind of got silent. We didn't know what to even say to one another. You know, we were just kind of like sitting there. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe me or not. It doesn't. It only matters to you. Because we know what we saw. We know what we have. You need to see that. You need to understand that. That's it. Shortly after the event, during a press conference, former Arizona Governor Fife Symington childishly mocked the mass claims of the craft being of extraterrestrial origin. Now this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> but 10 years later... What did you see? Well, I saw a, uh, a huge craft just kind of 
come right over Squaw Peak. Um, that was, you know, it was just breathtaking. It was enormous, yeah. like an aircraft carrier in the sky. Is that about as close? Yeah, I as think you that's. Could... I think that's a fair description. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting. Maybe it's our next generation we're working on. Who knows? Well, we'll find out it someday. Now, some people believe that this craft was a TR-6 Telos, supposedly made by Northrop Grumman, the fifth largest aerospace and defense contractor in the world. But unfortunately, that claim and this graphic are fake as shit. I'm not saying this thing couldn't have been man-made, but someone honestly just made this up one day. Look into it. But the Phoenix Lights was or were a real event. Fast forward 19 years and there is still no clear explanation. Yeah, the debate has been going on sure for almost two decades and it's still going on. Now, just because these events aren't national holidays does not mean that we should forget about them. But all these people were apparently intimidated and had their lives threatened for supposedly seeing alien life. So clearly someone wants us to forget about it. And if you really think about it, this super advanced alien technology all these people are claiming to have seen would probably be a threat to the oil companies and the banks. Think about it. If you owned an oil monopoly and you saw that there was something better and cheaper. Of course you'd cover that up. Okay. Oh, yeah. It only makes sense. And also, I find it a little annoying that so many people have such a hard time trying to understand why they don't land. People always ask me, why don't they just land? Why the fuck would they want to land here? We shoot at them. We lie about their existence. We don't even collectively believe in them. We shoot at each other. We lie to each other. We're in complete disarray on this planet. You think they're gonna risk their life and land here just because you want to see an alien? Get the fuck over yourself. We humans are not that great. And we frankly don't deserve the respect of an otherworldly race, let alone the invitation to shake hands with one. We're probably gonna want to work on ourselves a little bit more before a galactic civilization would ever give two shits about people like us. The main reason why more aliens aren't landing is because we're apparently shooting them down, not making the idea of visiting very appealing at all. But there is good news. They supposedly do land, and it doesn't seem to go that well. Here's a good example. In September 1994, over 60 children from this school in the suburbs of Harare, Zimbabwe, witnessed several objects landing and two beings coming out. 62 school children supposedly saw a UFO land near their schoolyard and then encountered several alien beings. Only a handful of them were willing to appear on camera to talk about it. I saw the object hovering. It was quite big, actually, and then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver, silver thing, and we saw a man standing next to it. Uh, what was it? What did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, going like that. Was he near the, uh, the silver object or was he far from? No, then top. On top of the silver yes. object. Did he look at you? He didn't give me the creeps, then I stopped Gave you the creeps. They seemed to have stiff necks. They didn't seem to move their necks like we can. They came running up here in such a panic. And, I mean, even if we had staged it, they could not have run all together like that. I was very skeptical in the beginning as well. Um, I believed that they'd seen something. But I think the consistency of, of what's been going on indicates that it was more than I was prepared to admit in the beginning. Some of the children actually reported receiving telepathic messages from these aliens, warning them of the harm we're inflicting on the Earth. Well, why do you think they might want us to be scared? Because, um, we, maybe because we, never, we don't look after the planet and the area properly. And is this an idea that uh, you have had before, that we don't look after the planet properly in the air? Or did this idea come to you when you had this experience? When I had this experience. I think they want um, people to know that we're actually making harm on this world and we mustn't get too technologed. The whole quality of the way they talk about it is the way a person 
talks about experience that, that happened to them. These kids supposedly saw aliens that telepathically warned them of the Earth's potential destruction. That is by far the most powerful way to wake people up and force them to start taking better care of the Earth and the environment. Just scare the shit out of some Poor kids. And it makes sense that if aliens do exist, some of them might be trying to look out for this planet in ways that we can't even do ourselves. Here are some of those kids 20 years later. All of a sudden, it was just like imaging going through my head of uh, a message, trying to, a communication. I describe it as, I guess, a telepathic communication. Um, there was no talking. I remember being very captivated by the eyes, and in that moment, however long it was, because I have no idea of the time frame, it was just, it was mesmerizing. It was absolutely captivating. As soon as I saw it, I knew that this was something from another planet or something from out of this worldly space. People need to know there is something else out there. I highly recommend watching the entirety of this video. There's a lot that I just can't fit in here. But John E. Mack was a Pulitzer Prize winning Harvard psychiatry professor who was at one point the leading authority on the subject of alien abduction, which we will get into shortly. John Mack was particularly known for advocating the spiritual or transformational effects of the alien phenomenon. John Mack was killed by a drunk driver in September 2004. I do not believe his death was part of a conspiracy, but it is a huge tragedy. Mac helped bring the alien abduction phenomenon to mainstream audiences. Why, if every other culture except this one in the history of the human race has believed there were other entities, other intelligences in the universe, why are we so goofy about this? Why, why do we treat people like they're crazy and humiliate them if they are experiencing some other entity, some other intelligence that's coming across? Why is everybody thought crazy if they have, if some intelligence is coming to them and they're honestly experiencing that this is the case? Because we like living in a little box with a closed door on it. I think that's basically you're, it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually a really good answer by Oprah. Because we like living in a little box. John Mack's best-selling book, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens, inspired many people to explore the ET issue and take it seriously, including Stephen Bassett, who some may say have carried the torch in leading the disclosure movement. Bassett is known as the UFO lobbyist. You've got contact going on, possibly with an untold number of individuals, and then underneath all of that, a growing number of mostly retired, some active military and government agency people, less constrained because of of their position are starting to talk. They're starting to write books, they're starting to come public and talk, they're starting to talk to researchers in private, they're going uh, in front of cameras, they're holding news conferences, and of course, and all of what they saw, did, and heard is supporting what the researchers had pretty much established as an extraterrestrial presence, the government knows about it, the government has embargoed it, and that the political media is violating every tenet of journalism by being complicit with this embargo. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. Something cool that he actually brought to light for a lot of people is the fact that Hillary Clinton has been interested in the UFO topic for a long time, proven by this photo. Taken in 1995 of Hillary Clinton walking with Lawrence Rockefeller at the JY Ranch in Wyoming, where she is seen holding a book that, when analyzed, appears to be Are We Alone? The Philosophical Implications of the Discovery of Extraterrestrial Life. Make what you want out of that. Now, one thing that we haven't really explored yet is the topic of supposed alien abductions. Is abduction cool, or is it a terrible experience? <laughs> Although Hollywood normally depicts alien abduction in a horrifying light, Leave us alone! abduction stories of all different kinds, good and bad, have been told by thousands of people. But a Roper poll from 1991 found that up to 4 million Americans might actually have been abducted by aliens. My son happened to walk in and he said uh, there was a spaceship outside and there were little guys around his bed and they put the dog to sleep which sounds bizarre. And as I was going down to sleep, I thought, hmm, there's a blue light coming through the blinds. And I thought, I wonder what that is. I just knew something really wrong, something just not right had happened to me. I woke up one night in the middle of the night and got up, and I found myself stopping and um, looking at this being that was standing in my living room and um, saying, um, stop this, I hate this, um, get away from me. And the next thing I know, I found myself lying down on the couch and a white light hitting me in the forehead and feeling paralysis. 
and uh, waking up um, the next morning and being uh, very afraid and very freaked out. Right out in front of us is this, this huge craft. There wasn't any fear then. It was just all total awe. We stood here, I guess side by side, my husband and I, for about 30 to 45 seconds. Then this tall dark being just appeared in front of the craft and, and he was followed by about another seven or eight that appeared straight behind him. They were your classic alien, grey shaped, no. cat-like, no, 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 they they're, weren't, okay. They, they were a form of human being. They were, they were a form of human being. Right. They so. had larger eyes than ours, smaller nose and smaller mouth. No protruding part of the ear and no hair. So but not people. Nothing like these classic greys you see your Whitley Strievers. I don't okay. know. I've never seen those. I don't know what they're talking sure, about. Sure, sure, okay. And I think the reason for their appearance within our reality is to come out of the box. Uh, we need is to, to help us to come out of the box. Yes, we need to redefine our definition of reality. Travis Walton is by far the most credible and famous alien abduction case. Him and five other loggers were out in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest when they came upon a craft of unknown origin. Travis went up to the craft and was supposedly hit by a beam of light, knocking him on his ass. The five other men fled in fear, thinking Travis was just dead. For five whole days, Travis was missing, and the authorities were under the impression that his friends had murdered him. Almost a week later, someone found Travis wandering along a highway, and when he returned turned to town, he had memories of being on an alien ship. And uh, they were coming towards me, so I just grabbed something off of that and I, and I struck out at them. Uh, they weren't close enough to hit, but I was just screaming threats. Their gaze, for some reason, it seemed like they were looking right into me in, in a really disturbing kind of way. They had pupils and irises and, and eyelids because I, I saw them blink. Travis Walton is the guy who the movie Fire in the Sky was based on. Although this movie portrays his experience in a typical fear-mongering Hollywood horror genre fashion, Travis has spoken out about the fact that his experiences were actually nothing like that, and the aliens he encountered were actually benevolent, as opposed to this. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Hollywood. In the movie, he wakes up in this disgusting cocoon thing, and he finds a dead body, they squirt a bunch of c into his eye, and then they stick a drill in it. In real life, he just woke up on a table and they gave him a tour of the ship. I really think it was an accident. I don't think they were firing at me or trying to stun me or punish me or anything like that. And it was just sort of an accident of circumstance. It just shows you that there really is a problem with how Hollywood is portraying this issue. And it doesn't really help our ability to visualize contact as an actual thing that's positive for us. But Travis's abduction was supposedly seen by five other people who all passed lie detector tests and have stuck to their story for over 40 years. Well, these were the key cases. Shermer, Bar Barney and Betty Hill, the Pascagoula incident, um, uh, Travis Walton. Um, now, there are hundreds of cases like this. Ah! The late Roger Lear was a podiatric surgeon best known as the expert of alien implant removal. Lear claimed to have removed nearly a dozen mysterious implants from his patients, all of which he claimed emitted radio signals and other strange properties that led him to believe that they were of extraterrestrial origin. And Jeremy Corbell's film, Patient 17, is a great expose into the work that Lear did with these supposed alien implants. Now, are you starting to see the unbelievably vast range of stories surrounding this topic so many individuals with their own unique story is it possible that they're all just making this stuff up now that sounds like the conspiracy theory to me the fact that all these people are individually conspiring to deceive the public into thinking they're aliens if you believe that then I think you're the conspiracy theorist simply accepting that there are aliens visiting us seems like a more rational approach especially after seeing all this evidence I'm not saying people don't lie and make stuff up people lie to their spouses, to their parents, to their children, to their friends about little things, big things, all things. But look at the effort that these people are going through to tell these stories. There's just nothing like this. Just search UFO conspiracy theory on Wikipedia and look at the size of that article. Would we really go to such an extent to make all of this up? There's just too much of it. If only one of these incidents is real, then that's still enough to make this seriously important. 
Now you're probably still wondering, why don't we hear more about this? Well, it seems that it's because some people really don't want you to know. And if these stories are true, then some people are going to some serious lengths to try and cover this up. They had told her not to ever speak of it again and, and what the consequences would be. He said somebody would be picking your bones out of the sand if you do that, so. They're hollering and cursing and you didn't see anything, you know, and we'll do you and your whole goddamn family. And again, I cannot prove this because I'm not a physicist, but supposedly the main reason for the cover-up is the free energy technology that these aliens supposedly have, otherwise known as zero-point energy. If that is real, then there's the possibility that we'll discover how these things fly and we'll find a technology better than oil in every way. And that is a threat to seriously powerful people. It's not even a cover-up. It's really just a distraction with tons of other bullshit so nobody notices. I think it's entirely possible that aliens have landed and they haven't been able to get our attention because we're so preoccupied with cleavage and shoes. This shit is out. It's just nobody notices because it's not force-fed to them every morning on the news. It's ignored for a reason. You're not dealing with fossil fuels. You're not dealing with conventional rockets. You're dealing with an entirely new area of physics, which if it was disclosed would mean the end of big oil, the end of the petrodollar, the end of public utilities as we know it. It would be an entirely new energy paradigm. I had a sighting when I was a young child and started an organization later uh, called the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence to look into are we alone and what can we do as citizens to bring out this information and perhaps make contact. And according to research done by Stephen Greer, it seems that the United States government has suppressed a shit ton of inventions, several thousand supposedly. And these are all energy inventors who claim that their work has been suppressed by the government or some high powered financial interests. These are all well documented cases. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for this being a real ongoing thing that's been happening. I can't sit here and tell you for a fact that we've definitely figured out how free energy works, but people do believe in it. Just like a lot of people believe these stories. And I think if these stories are true, then it's pretty clear that ETs are trying to tell us to stop destroying ourselves and our planet with weapons. If you look at the history of UFOs disarming nukes and abductees and contactees reporting telepathic images of apocalyptic warnings, that could be why they're here. Because we are killing the planet. They wouldn't be here to save us. We'd have to do that ourselves. But it seems like they're trying to save the Earth. There seems to be whatever the source of this, these alien beings is, whoever their managers are, uh, seems concerned that we're, what we're doing to this incredibly beautiful planet. And they get images of the destruction that Peter's had that, these Earth being destroyed. And that has a very powerful effect on the consciousness of the experiencers. Maybe this is the reason why Oprah got so environmental. So instead of going out and searching for UFOs, maybe we should just be going out and trying to improve this Earth so it's a place people actually would want to come and visit. And instead of sitting around and watching videos like this, you should be sitting and watching that new Leonardo DiCaprio documentary about global warming. That shit might win him another Oski. Oh yeah. I'm gonna leave you now with a couple of good quotes. What's the nature of the universe we live in? What is our relationship to the larger reality? If that's a part of the larger reality and we're denying it, uh, that to me is unconscionable. I don't live that way. If, uh, the <clears throat> I went into space to learn about the universe we live in. We have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. Thanks for watching. Think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we felt threatened by a space invader. That's the whole theory of independence. You're right. You and Bill O'Reilly would be hiding in a bunker together. <laughs> I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers 
which are cited to justify it. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex.